praise the Lord, all you nations. Praise him, all you people, for his merciful kindness is great towards us. And the truth of the Lord endureth forever. Praise ye the Lord. Amen. 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 Let's come and praise the Lord this morning. Let's get your hymnals and turn to page 136. 136. service today. Bless each and every one of us that's here, Lord. And just uh, be with us, Lord, to, to live on your path, Lord, and spread your word and touch hearts, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Let's remain standing. We're going to sing another song. Praise 139. <laughs>
praise the Lord uh, for who he is and what he's accomplished in, in our behalf and throughout the world, literally. So let's be grateful for that. All right, you may be seated. We're going to go ahead and take our offerings if we get the men together. Let me just say that, now listen very carefully, tonight uh, at BBT there in Clarksburg, Snowwood area, uh, we'll be having a meeting. That's one reason why uh, Brother Gil Van Gilbert is here with us today. He's going to speak here in just a little bit. But we have, we've done this, I think, eight straight years where we've had a, a, a preparatory meeting for revival. And in 2025, that seems like a long way away. Two years from now, uh, we're planning a meeting now that's going to engulf all the churches that are wanting to be a part of it uh, in the month of uh, November, I believe it is. And, okay. All right. So we're going to be gathering together and encouraging others to be a part of that. So be praying about that. But this is why we are doing this, is to kind of pull and, and come together as churches realize our purpose is to see revival and win souls to Christ. So that, that will be coming up here in a couple of years. But tonight we're going to be meeting and we encourage you to come. We're going to be leaving here at 520 uh, in the van. If you want to drive with going to the van with us, I will be heading to, up there. i leave here at 520. And then I got a phone call today that one of the men, uh, preachers that's uh, involved in this, I wanted to let people know that if you want to sing tonight, and I'm not a special, but if you want to sing be part of the choir, to get there no later than 515. So you'd have to go on your own to do that. But I hope and pray that uh, some will take up the challenge and, and be there and be a part of that, okay? So that's uh, tonight. Um, then we will sing another song. Uh, you notice we've got a, a, a guest here with us today. Um, Brother John uh, tied him up and brought him here today. <laughs> so he's here, to, he's here just to be blessed by the things that are going on. And uh, I've been saved very long ago. And uh, so I just wanted to come give a few minutes testimony if you could to yeah. share yeah. what's on your heart, what happened to you. Yeah. Hey, you guys. Uh, thank you. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here to meet everybody. <clears throat> so my name is uh, Sri Ram. And I, you know, I got saved, uh, I think, the Lord a little over a year ago, a year and a quarter, uh, last summer. And it was just a long journey since I was, I was a kid. I was always seeking what is the truth, what is that, um, what is that that's going to give me that um, that freedom and that that joy and that love that I always wanted. I always knew that there was something uh, far greater in life, and that there was I was destined to like really experience that. That we were all built for that. We were built to experience this profound joy, this profound love. And essentially, what I found out last year. When my aunt, who's a secret Christian in India with her friend, she witnessed to me and she helped explain to me that 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 is Jesus. Like that yeah, yeah. that that joy is Christ and and how the, the spirit that was leading me on my journey of seeking God and finding the truth was manifested in Jesus. And what I began to learn is that that's only the beginning and that there's more to it, that our joy and that we can really begin to experience the heaven on earth in our hearts as we begin to yield to the Holy Spirit and begin to change what we think and act in faith to break through strongholds, negative ways of thinking, and other issues to really experience the freedom. I know that I had, um, when I came to Christ, I really wanted victory from certain sin issues. I wanted victory in ways I was thinking, and God was showing to me that the ways I was thinking, there was patterns in my thoughts, there were strongholds in my life that were really blocking the joy of the Lord from being within me. And what I began to realize is the only way to get free from that is not just expecting the Lord in salvation, <coughs> but is to walk in the Spirit, is to yield to Him. And when I found out that what yielding is, essentially, is when the Lord convicts us and shows us uh, something in, in our hearts that's a hindrance, or He's leading us in a way, it's taking a step of faith and grabbing His hand and walking with Him. And when the Lord was showing me strong, I want you to change your way of thinking here. I want you to believe differently about this issue in your life. I want you to, um, I want you to start taking these different actions. It was, um, it was a very, it was, it was a struggle for me to like take those steps of faith. But as I took those steps of faith to follow God wherever He was leading me, I began to experience more and more of His joy because every time I followed Him in a certain area of my life. Um, 
and a stronghold was removed, his joy, his love, and his fruit would just bubble out of me. And that's what I've been really after for the past four months, especially, is trying to yield more and more. And I can say now that I'm truly like waking up every day and I feel like I got led to heaven early. I really do. And it's just from that process of being able to just uh, take those steps of faith, and even though it's like really, really difficult sometimes because those strongholds can be strong, and the devil's saying, Don't follow, let me just take a step of following. That's what God's really showing me now, and that's what I'm also here. It's about I'm trying to learn about the revival spirit and to learn more about how can we help everybody get into that zone, that mode of just following the Holy Spirit because it's He's trying to, when He's talking to us, He's trying to help us really. Um, experience that joy, that fruit, and it's possible. And I think we all know deep down in our hearts, like that is possible. And I don't want any of us to be satisfied or um, uh, settle for anything less than that glory that He has waiting for us. And it's there. And I want, I just want to share the testimony that, like, it was, I'm 23 now, like 22 years of suffering and, like, this grueling search to know, like, is there that joy there? And it's there. And I can finally say with all confidence that it's there. And it's so much more deeper than I've ever imagined. I think that we can all um, just con continue to fight and search and yield, and it's, we're going like, to experience an amazing, amazing life. So, um, Amen. Yeah. I'm going to try to pronounce his name. Shri Ram. Shri Ram, yeah. All right. And that's his name. That I don't think it was a coincidence today that <clears throat> the missionary we prayed for uh, is going to India, and, and then we had a Native person there from that country here with us today. You grew up in America, though, didn't you? Uh, yes, yeah, so I was born in Ohio, and then a few months after I was born, my parents sent me to India to live with my grandparents. And I spent maybe two and a half, three years with my grandparents in India, and then came back to the United States. Okay. I had a trip starting to the once in a while. Amen. Okay. All right. Praise the Lord. All right. Darcy's going to lead us in another song here. Let's sing out. <clears throat> this is our oh, opportunity. Let's all stand again and turn to page 241. Grace that was greater than our sin.
seated. <coughs> Excuse me, Doris and Doris are going to sing for us here this morning. And uh, so I trust you'll follow through here. Okay. Um, I wanted to say too, Mike Ferris is one of our missionaries. Uh, his mother-in-law passed away um, here, I think it was two days ago. So they, they've been through a lot here recently and now another another death there. And his, of course, Kim had to she has surgery scheduled for Friday and to move it to next Friday. So, you know, be a part of her mother's funeral. So let's really pray for them right now. That God will encourage them and work in their life. And something good will come out of all this. Right.
Pastor, what a joy to be back. Proverbs 18 in your Bibles, please. Proverbs 18. And uh, thank you for that song a moment ago. That uh, is the duet. That was a blessing. I've never heard that song before, but that spoke to all of my hearts. And uh, it's a joy to be here. I appreciate uh, Sri Ram being uh, here and his testimony. Uh, he uh, been hungry, and he is uh, part of the group that's uh, he did from Graduate University of Michigan. I hope you forgive me for that. But, uh, at any rate, uh, they're on the campus. Uh, so we have a ministry in our church. My whole church is in Ann Arbor, Michigan, Ann Arbor Baptist. I'm not there much, but uh, he's a part of the ministry there that's on the campus, and they're seeing people saved. Uh, he was telling us about that at the uh, Thanksgiving praise service. So praise the Lord. Uh, God's, uh, God's working in a lot of places, and a lot of, a lot of different people, and that's all a tremendous blessing. And I remember the meeting here a couple of years ago, and uh, it's a good to be back for this day. And, uh, of course, a lot of special things going on. I enjoyed the Sunday School Hour. By the way, I heard the introduction for this series that's coming up here on Job. That's going to be a great series. I wish I could be here. And, uh, you know, because uh, he pointed out that Job had to suffer a lot. He pointed out that, uh, you know, it was the enemy, but God never told him it was the enemy. He just had to learn how to face that suffering. Well, we all have to face suffering. And so that's a book that all of us can relate to and learn from. I hope you'll be a part of that. If you're not presently in that, jump in. Jump in right now because uh, they're just at the introductory stage, and that'll be a blessing to you. Uh, tonight, in the uh, service that uh, Pastor mentioned over at uh, uh, Stonewood at uh, Baptist Bible Temple, that's what it's called, right? Uh, the uh, the Satara Twins, I'm sure you've been told this, are going to be there. They were here with us yesterday. Now... You know, uh, in 2019, I came right here for the college uh, to deal to do the major revivals in church history. And it's wonderful to read the books and tell the stories. These guys have been there. They're 91. <laughs> and they were a part of one of the great revivals in North America. It's called the Canadian Revival of 1971. And God was on the move in the late 60s and early 70s. What a time. Uh, God was moving in a lot of different places, a lot of different ways. Uh, but the Canadian Revival is an amazing story as a church. And, uh, you know, every story is different. You know, in this case, it actually started in a Baptist church. You know what that means? There's hope. <laughs> but uh, at any rate, uh, the revival did start in a Baptist church, and it just outgrew their building. That was like six, 700. And then they had, to, they had to ask the Anglicans for their building. It was pretty soon that Alliance building, the Presbyterian, and then there, I think, a civic auditorium before it was all over, drawing three to 4,000 people a night by the end of the seventh week. And then it went on from Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, to Regina, to Winnipeg. It, it busted all out over Western Canada, and then uh, just phenomenal. Uh, some spurts into Eastern Canada, some into uh, the state of Oregon, believe it or not, the state of Illinois got uh, uh, touched. Uh, in other words, people would go from that revival, they would go somewhere else and just tell what God was doing for their soul, and the, the fire would jump. Uh, Michigan, the country of Holland. Now, these are the evangelists that God used. Now, you're going to find me, if you're coming tonight, they're regular people. They crack jokes, they laugh, <laughs> they enjoy life. Uh, these are regular people, and God used them. And this is first-hand account. So tonight, they're going to tell a story. And uh, I'll be asking them questions, but they're going to be the ones talking, and they're going to tell us the story of the Canadian Revival of 1971. That uh, it's, it's phenomenal. Uh, when I began to study revival history, especially in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, it was about uh, probably 20-some years ago, I read the books on the Canadian Revival. And about 10 years ago, I was in a meeting down in Atlanta, and somebody said, Hey, Ralph Sutero lives in this area. Would you like to meet him? I said, Like to meet him? Absolutely. And so I've known Brother Ralph for the last 10 years or so. I got to meet Brother Lou uh, the, for the first time yesterday. Both of these men have the joy of the Lord. Bless the Lord. That's the Holy Spirit. You'll be blessed tonight. I hope you'll not miss. Well, Proverbs 18 in the Word of God this morning. I want to look at a proverb, obviously, that paints a picture. And may the Lord take this truth and may the Holy Spirit speak it to our hearts. Thank you, Brother Freeman, for the privilege of being here. Appreciate your pastor so much. All right, Proverbs 18, verse 10. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runs into it and is safe. I want to speak.
speak this morning of our strong tower. Uh, let's pray. Let's ask the Spirit of God to be our teacher. Bless the Holy Spirit. We need you right now to open the eyes of our understanding to the truth connected to these picturesque words. And Lord, would you so illumine the truth that you convince us of the truth that we would actually apply the action step of faith in this very verse. Lord, even today. Oh, Lord, meet with us. Breathe on us. And uh, touch us, Lord. Yes. Lord, you know the needs of every heart, every person here, every family. And uh, Lord, this church, Lord, may we know that you're speaking to us. And may we run to you. And so, Lord, I plead the blood to protect us from the attack of the enemy. Uh, who would seek to hinder in any way. So, Lord Jesus, we claim our position in you on the throne far above the enemy. And in your name, we exercise your authority over any powers of darkness that would seek to hinder at this time. And trust you that that's simply not be allowed. So, Lord, speak to us. Lord, would you meet with us? May we meet with you. We thank you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. A number of years ago, I was in the country of Ireland. I go there often. I have a dear friend named David O'Gorman. And uh, he uh, sometimes will go and we'll take a trip out and see the countryside. And a lot of neat uh, stuff to see over there. The Emerald Isle, as they call, uh, call it. And he took me to a town called, called Glendalough. Uh, the term lock over there is lake for us. And so this is a beautiful town uh, situated on the end of a long lake. Uh, Glenda, Glenda Lake, Glenda Lock. And there's some mountains that uh, are surrounded and it's all green. And uh, we've walked up on top of those mountains to look down on the, uh, the lake and so on. Well, the town is really neat because there's a present day town. But in the center, there are ancient ruins from a previous time period. Now, over there, they got castles and stuff like that. Well, in this town, there's not a castle, but there's a tower that literally towers above everything else in the whole valley. And when you look up places to see in Ireland, you'll see pictures of this. Well, we were looking at the ancient ruins, and then now we're right at the bottom of this, this tower. And my friend, Dave, said, now, John, notice, notice where the door is. It was not at ground level. It was well out of reach, way up there. And there's no staircase. And the way it worked is in former time periods, when an enemy came, they would sound an alarm, and everybody that was in that area would run to the tower. And they had a rope type ladder, I'm told, uh, that uh, they would uh, throw out, and people would climb up, and the last one in would pull up the rope, shut the door, and apparently it worked because the tower still stands. And that is the exact picture that we have here in this Hebrew text, this proverb. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it and is safe. That picture of a central fortress, which in times of danger, the surrounding population can run to and find refuge. Now notice, it's not just a tower, it's a strong tower. It's a worthy place of refuge. It is a place where you can go and actually find the safety that you are seeking. And notice it says, the name of the Lord is. This is more than a promise. But praise the Lord for the promises. Those are the will be's and the shall be's. This is an is. This is not a potentiality. This is a reality right now. You know why that's important? Because when you need this kind of safety, you can't wait a long time to get to it. You need it right now. And it says, the name of the Lord is. Yes. Is. Is. Right now. This strong tower. Ah, uh, yes. And uh, the righteous run into it. Now, somebody might say, well, you know, I knew there was a catch in there somewhere. <laughs> the righteous, oh, you know, I'm not very righteous. And oh, things aren't going too well, man. If you know how defeated I was this week, you'd be embarrassed to shake my hand. Now, look. It says, the righteous. It's talking about a group of individuals who, at some point in their life, have understood sin is the problem. Judgment is the consequence. But Jesus is the answer. Amen. And have made that choice to depend on Jesus to actually save them from the sin and hell. And at that moment, not only are their sins forgiven, not only does he move in, but they are, uh, what we're told here, they're justified. That is, when you put your faith in Jesus, your sin is put on him so that his righteousness is legally and judicially put on you. And you become a part of that group that God calls 
the righteous. Not your own righteousness, the righteousness of Jesus credited to your account. Now, friend, even if this last week was a bad week for you, if you're saved, you're in that group. Because not your righteousness. It's the righteousness of Jesus. And you have the privilege of what this text is talking about. Friend, if you're not in that group, you need to get at it. You need to, you need to, you need to put your faith in Jesus and be saved. But if you are saved, you're in the group here that says, the righteous runneth into it. This is your privilege. This is amazing. The righteous runneth into it. That's the tower. But the tower is the name of the Lord. And so you're running into the name. Yeah. Tying right into New Testament terminology. In his name. It's a beautiful picture of dependence in him. And so, you have this great promise, and it's safe. That we're safe and set on high, safe above the trouble. So we have a very beautiful, really simple text. The object of faith is given in the first phrase. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The exercise of faith is given in the second phrase. The righteous run into it. And the promise of faith is found in the third phrase. And is safe. So there is an obvious lesson, is there not? Run. Run to the tower. Run to the tower of the name <coughs> of the Lord. Now, the key to faith is the object of faith. And I was here last time, Sunday morning, I preached a message called the key of faith. I'm sure you remember that with all the details, but in case you forgot, the key to faith is not us. We're the subject of faith. The key to faith is God, the object of faith. Now, friends, it's a wonderful thing to realize that the key to faith is not us. It's him. So stop looking at you. Stop looking at the problem and stop looking at Jesus. He's the solution. See, he's the answer. He's the object. He's the tower. He is the, the safety that we need. And so, let's focus on the name. Because it's the name of the Lord that is the strong tower. And the righteous run up into it and say, let's focus on that name. Because the name represents the person and all the attributes of that person. Now, the name of God and all of his attributes is a vast subject. <laughs> a, a vast, uh, too vast for time, probably too vast for eternity. So this morning, we're not even going to scratch the surface. We're, you know, I'm not even sure we're going to scratch the scratch. <laughs> but uh, let's take the time that we have and focus on this name. Now, you'll notice in your Bible that the name Lord is in all capitals. You may have noticed that. And that means it's seeking to represent a particular Hebrew name that's underneath that. He goes to seek to represent that particular Hebrew name by using the capital letters here. If you've ever heard the term Jehovah, that's the name. In more recent years, theologians are pronouncing it Yahweh. That's dealing with the Hebrew language. You're not going to mess with that. But the bottom line is, this is a particular name. Now, it's interesting that this name, of course, is used by itself. It's also used in conjunction with other words, other Hebrew words. And they form what the theologians call the Jehovah titles. Like if you've ever heard the title Jehovah with Jaira, right? That's what we're talking about. Now, in the Old Testament, there are 10 Jehovah titles. So if we took those 10 titles plus the name Lord by itself, we would have an 11 point message. And no one said amen. <laughs> you know, that's just not going to work, you know. <laughs> uh, we're going to have to pare this down somehow. Well, it's interesting that in our English Bible here, uh, in King James, these Jehovah titles, three of them, excuse me, no, seven of them, let me get this straight, seven of them are translated. One is very familiar to you. You may not know it as a Jehovah title because it is translated. It's Psalm 23, verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd. Okay, that's a Jehovah title. Literally, the Lord, my shepherd. <laughs> Personalize it. The Lord is my shepherd. You know, if we took those seven that are translated like that, plus the name Lord by itself, we'd have an eight-point message. 
And no one said amen. So Brother Truman, this is just not going to work. You know, there's something about the Sunday morning service. you got to finish on time. You know, beat the Methodists and the Presbyterians to the restaurants, whatever. Uh, but uh, we're going to have to pare this down somehow a little bit more here. So what if we take the last three that are not translated? They're transliterated. That simply means they take a, a Hebrew letter and they break it into the English and create a word like Jehovah Jireh. Let's take those three plus the name more by itself and we have a four-point message. And amen or not, we're stopping right there. Okay. <laughs> now, let's begin with the name Lord by itself. This is the beautiful picture of the strong tower of life. Life. I love this. Do you know that the name Lord, Jehovah, Yahweh, that this name occurs in our Old Testament 5,000. 321 times. Now, if you know anything about the number of the occurrences of particular words in our Bible, this is astounding. Do you know, apparently, God wants us to know him by his name. It's an amazing name. This is the name that God himself used when Moses turned aside out there in the wilderness thinking, you know, that life was all falling apart and things didn't work out in Egypt like he had hoped. And now he's out here in the wilderness and he sees this bush and it's burning and it's not burning up. It's not consumed. And so he says, what's going on here? And God speaks to him. And uh, God commissions him to go back to Egypt and lead the people of God out of Egypt. And Moses wasn't too excited about this job. And so he's asked him all sorts of questions. He's trying to get out of it and so on. Well, one of the questions he asked was, well, who am I going to tell him sent me? And at that point, God translates the name. I am that I am. That's the translation of the, of the name, Lord. Yes. And he says, you tell him that I am. And send me a name. Yes. The I am, the eternal God, the eternal, the God who dwells in the eternal present tense. You see, since he's I am, that means he was and he will be, but it's because he is. Wow. Tozer put it this way. God is at the beginning of time as we know it, and at the end of time as we know it, at the same time. If you think too hard about that, you might see a little labor coming out of a few heads, but uh, 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 we might short circuit. But the, that's amazing. This is our God. This is, this is the self existent one. The God who dwells in the eternal present tense. It indicates his faithful presence. That's why the text can say that the name of the Lord is. See, his faithful, immediate presence. In Genesis 21, verse 33, this name, Lord, is explained as the everlasting God. Now let's tap in and tie into New Testament terminology. The eternal life. See, the everlasting God. The everlasting life. You know, Jesus said in John chapter 10, uh, I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it, the life, more abundantly. And friends, we need to understand that when you believe on Jesus, you have eternal life. That's what he said in John 6, 47. He who believes in me has eternal life. And eternal life is not something. Eternal life is somewhat. Because in 1 John 1, 2, Jesus is called that eternal life. 1 John 5, 28. Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. And friends, when you believe in Jesus, when you trust him to save you from sin and hell, when you realize sin is the problem, hell's the consequence, Jesus is my only hope. He died for my sins. He rose again. He offers salvation. And you cast your dependence on him to save you. At that moment, among so many of the other salvation truths, you receive his very own eternal life. You have him. He says, I want you to have that life, and I want you to have it more abundantly. That means if we're not experience, experiencing the abundance of his life, we're missing out. <coughs> you know, 
you can have him and ignore him. You can have him and not trust him. Oh, you trusted him for salvation. Praise the Lord for that. Your sins are forgiven. You have his righteousness credited into your account, bless the Lord. You're justified. But you know, the very fact that the Bible talks about us and urges us and admonishes us and commands us to walk by faith, it means it's possible to not do. To not walk by faith. Even though you got saved by faith, just as a child is born, it's got to grow. We're born again, we've got to go. We've got to walk. God wants us to walk. He wants us to grow in grace. And you do that when you walk by faith. And when you do, you begin to tap into the abundance that abundant life, that fruit of him which is love, and that's joy and peace and long-suffering gentleness and goodness and faith and meekness and temperance all at the same time. Because he is that all at the same time. When you access him, you access all. And friends, there's an abundancy there. Yes. And we have to ask ourselves, you know, if, if, if things are pretty uh, opposite of abundant, <laughs> what's in the way? That's when we need to get honest about whatever's in the way. That's what the, uh, the twin evangelists taught us on yesterday, that the hindrance is to revive. That's when we need to get honest and let the blood of Jesus come in like a tsunami and clean us up, First John 1 way, so that we can have all the hindrances taken away and experience Jesus. See, the Spirit from life is when the Spirit fills you with the life of Jesus. His life is abundant. There it is. But if that's mine, then it's time for revival. You know what the word mine means? Life! There it is! It's life again! Yes. Restoration to, to life again! Restoration to the life of God, the life of Jesus in you! Accessing the eternal life as the abundant life! That's revival! When that life is now accessed and you're restored back to life! Him! So that it's you, yet not you, but Christ in you, animating you. And thus, you're experiencing him in genuine revival. Years ago, we were holding a netcasters evangelistic training seminar. Uh, net seminars, we called it. Uh, so netcasters here, haven't you? Yeah. In the, in the college? Yeah. Okay, so that's all right, that's all right. We were all going to these week-long modules and so on. And, uh, of course, on the Spirit for Life, as you know, applying to witnessing. And uh, uh, when we did the module thing, uh, we would announce a time in a church and blah, 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 and get it all arranged and people would come in from the area, sometimes from other parts of the country, sometimes from other countries, uh, once in a while. But at any rate, we were holding the Nets in Chicago. And the host church was a large church. And uh, so a number of their staff were taking uh, the course that week. We had people coming from a lot of different states. We did have a missionary from Spain that was a part of it that uh, particular time. And uh, at the beginning of the, uh, the week, you know, we start on Monday morning, goes to Friday night. Those were grueling, <laughs> grueling modules, i got to say. <laughs> but uh, uh, at any rate, um, we would always ask everybody, why are you here? They would give us their answer. I don't know. Never let us hold Christ. Or I just uh, feel ill-equipped. Or, uh, you know, whatever. They give us their various things. Well, one guy, he was the youth pastor of this church. It was a large church. The youth was about 150, if I remember correctly. He'd been there five years, winsome guy, sharp, handsome, you know, witty, all, uh, you know, this, you know, magnetic, you know, personality, youth pastor, uh, caricature that you would dream of. Well, that's what he was. But he stands up. And he says, I am here because I do not understand what it means to be filled with the Spirit. He said, I don't know what that means. And he said, I have to know. And he wasn't joking. He said, I cannot come to the end of this week and not know what it means to be filled with the Spirit. I'm going to tell you, I want to shout. Because when there's that kind of hunger, God's going to fill. The Bible says so. He satisfies the longing soul and fills the hungry soul with goodness. By Wednesday, the man was in revival. He was in radical, personal revival. Now, on Wednesday night, we had the midweek service there at the church. We broke from the seminar. I spoke in the church. Uh, the teens normally in there, the way they did it, they had a, a breakout group. And normally he had his fancy stuff that he would do and his uh, handouts and stuff. He tossed all of that. And he went to that youth meeting and began to declare to those teenagers what God was doing for his soul. Friends, when God meets with you, declare it. 
You'll he'll be amazed at what God does in others when you are when you're honest about what God's doing in you. And so uh, uh, he gets up and he says to his young people, he says, you know, I've been here for five years as youth, you're a youth pastor. He said, I owe you an apology. apology. He says, I have not shown you what God can do. Everything I've done, I've done in just the strength of what man can do. Man can be funny, man can have activities, man can do all this. And he said, I owe you an apology. You've not seen me. He was broken. You know, teenagers know when you're honest or when you're faking it. They knew he was honest. And do you know when he got honest? Without any human leadership, teenagers started getting honest. They started confessing their sins. In fact, some knew that they were not right with mom and dad. They left the youth meeting, no human leadership, drawn by the Holy Spirit across this large campus, big church, and found, you know, went into the auditorium. I'm up there preaching found their parents somewhere in the audience, walked down the aisle, tapped them on the shoulder, said, I gotta talk to you now. And got right with mom and dad. I mean, revival busted. I mean, a corporate revival broke out is what happened. In fact, one of the mothers told me later that uh, her daughter told her, she said, you know, when all of that started happening, we could not stay on our seats. It just didn't seem right. We had to get down. Why? Because they're in the presence of God. That's why. And so a revival broke out in that youth group because of a revival in one man's life. Why? Because he was running to the tower. I don't know what it means to be filled with the Spirit. Here I'm saved. I'm going through all these motions. But I need life. Well, he was already saved. He needed life again. It's revival. And friend, if that is your need, if things are just kind of tall, if things are just not on, and, and there's not an abundancy and, and so forth. Ask the Spirit of God to show you what's in the way. And the Holy Spirit, uh, he speaks specifically. He'll, he'll, show, he'll, he'll tell you. And you can run. And you can get honest. In this case, for this guy, it was self-dependence. It's not like he was involved in vice and sin. It was just that he was flesh-dependent, trying to do the work of God. And God broke him of that unbelief. Because when you're dependent on the flesh, you're not dependent on God. It's unbelief. And when he got honest, God came. And when you get honest, God will come to you too. So there it is, the strong tower of life. Secondly, we see the strong tower of provision. This is the first of our Jehovah titles that is transliterated. Jehovah Jireh, it occurs one time. It's Genesis 22. God had commanded Abraham to sacrifice his only son Isaac. And so they're going to the place of sacrifice. And uh, when he sees Matt Moriah off in the distance, he says to his servants, you stay here. My son and I will go and worship the Lord and return. Well, that was faith because he's commanded by God to slay his son. But he knew God was going to do something. And as they're going, Isaac says to his dad, hey, dad, uh, I see the fire and uh, I see the wood. Uh, where's the lamb? Good question. And Abraham runs to the tower when he says, God will provide himself a lamb. And they get to the place he builds the altar. Commentators believe that Isaac was a full-blown adult at this point. I think they're right. That means he cooperated. That means they were both exercising faith. And here he is bound on the altar. And Abraham takes that knife and raises it, knowing that if need be, God would raise his son from the dead. I can't even imagine doing this. But he did in faith. And the angel of the Lord stopped him. And then he sees a ram in the thicket. Say, why not a lamb? Because there's only one lamb of God. Uh, but he saw the ram in the thicket and he offered the ram in the stead of his son. Now, atonement means a lot, but part of what it means is exchange, an exchange for his son. And in gratitude, Abraham calls the name of that place Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who provides. God, my provider. Wow, what's your need today? Provision. What it's, you know what's neat? The Lord will provide. It doesn't say just, you know, clothes or food or money or whatever. It, there's a lot that can go under this. Let the Holy Spirit apply. But you know, God is the provider. And yes, He provides in all sorts of ways, including practical ways. I was just reading the other day another article on what's happening in the country of Uzbekistan. Uh, if you wonder where that is, 
Uh, there's India, who we talked about, then there's uh, Pakistan, there's Afghanistan, and then there's a few other stands before you get to Russia. Okay, it's up there somewhere in that stand part of the world. Uh, there's a country called Uzbekistan, and the persecution there is pretty intense. And uh, of course, the martyrs uh, brings uh, that country out every so often. Well, I remember some lady 15 years ago or so, and they brought an article out about a guy, and then a couple years later about the same guy. It's interesting, this guy's been thrown in jail several different times for doing what I do, for preaching the Word of God. And uh, uh, he was thrown into prison this one time, and he thought it was going to be it. The uh, persecution had kicked up. He thought they would kill him. Uh, but uh, 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 he was there, and his wife, you know, his, his children were small. They lived out in the country, you know, and, and so uh, uh, to survive, even as far as food, they would have their own little garden and, and so on. So his wife and kids were just living off of whatever they had had. Uh, the church had disbanded because they were afraid to meet. I don't blame them. I don't understand. We've not been in their shoes. And so here he is in prison six months. To a shock, he gets released. He comes back to the church, but nobody would come. They were afraid. Interesting. They're humans just like us. And uh, that man in that empty building where they would meet, praise God for two days. It's faith. The fact is, they were running out of food. His wife had survived from whatever he had in the garden, but he hadn't been there to till it and replant. And the kids were small, and so now they didn't have anything. And, uh, nobody would come and give them anything. Uh, nobody would give them a job. The church people were afraid to be seen around. So they were now destitute. You know, we, you know, we say we're starving when we haven't eaten for three and a half hours. <laughs> they were starving. Literally. The seven-year-old Mark said to the dad, Dad, I'm so hungry. Daddy, what are we going to ask some food? Can you imagine this, Dad? Can you imagine your own child asking that and you don't have any physical way to provide? He said to his daughter, he said, I think we're going to have breakfast in the morning. He got up early to pray. She got up early because she remembered the promise. Daddy, I'm so hungry. What are we going to have some food, Daddy? You can imagine the heartbreak. The man looked to the Lord, ran to the tower of Jehovah Jireh, prayed, called on God. He said to his daughter, We're going to have breakfast in just a bit. Let's go out in the garden and work while we wait. They went out in the garden uh, to their shop, coming down the country road. I mean, when they came down their country road, they were far out in the country, and here comes this uh, car, and they pulled up their driveway. They didn't recognize the car. Two men got out. They didn't recognize the man. The man looked at this pastor and called him by name. He said, we were supposed to be somewhere else today, but the Lord sent us here to you to give you this. And in an envelope, he opened it. He and his daughter were standing right there. Inside was the equivalent of one month's wages. <laughs> they were so stunned, so overwhelmed, because now they can only get the food and so on. Uh, that the car was pulling the, out of the driveway back down the road and they hadn't even said thank you because they were just so overwhelmed. So uh, the dad and the daughter ran down their driveway and turned the corner down the country road to wave the car down so they could stop and, and say thank you. But when they turned to look, there was no car to be seen. There was no fading engine sound. There was no cloud of dust and no fresh traffic. Because the Bible tells us in Hebrews that God, when he chooses to, uses his angels as ministering spirits. And the little girl looked up at her dad and said, Dad, from now on, your God will be my God. Friends, it is time that we so run to God, that God is so seen and so real in our lives, that people are impacted. So the strong tower of life, the strong tower of provision, thirdly, the strong tower of victory. This is Jehovah Nissi. occurs one time. It's Exodus chapter 17, verse 15. Now, a couple of chapters earlier, and God sends those plagues in Egypt. And finally, there's the final uh, plague. And, and for Israel, they're to slay the lamb and have the Passover and put the blood on, on the doorpost and uh, on the, the sides. And, and when I see the blood, I'll pass over you and God will let them out. And then they feast uh, uh, the Red Sea in front and the armor of Pharaoh behind. And God parted the Red Sea, a wall unto them on their left, the Bible says, and a wall unto them on their right. The first and greatest world's aquarium show. And they walk through those walls of water on dry ground. And now they're out in the wilderness. 
they get attacked. Let me, theologians suggest it's a picture of the flesh because now they've been redeemed out of Egypt. That's the picture of salvation. And there's still an attack. What is it? Well, there's the flesh. And I think it's a fair analogy. But at any rate, it's a people group called Amalek. And so Joshua goes down to lead uh, uh, the Israelite uh, men in the battle. Oh, yeah, these guys have been slaves. They're not trained, but they were winning. And Abraham, uh, I mean, uh, Moses is up on top, and he's, he's holding up the rod of God, representing God's authority, and they're winning. But his arms got tired. Yeah, it's kind of hard to hold your arms uh, for a long time. And uh, they begin to lower, and they begin to notice right away that when the rod of God lowered, the battle would begin to turn and, and uh, uh, turn against Israel uh, toward Amalek. And Aaron and Hur said enough of this. And they uh, sat Moses down on the rock. They got on either side and held his arms up so the rod of God, uh, uh, representing God's authority, was held high. And God gave Israel victory. In gratitude, Moses built an altar. And he called it Jehovah. Let's see. was me. The Lord is my banner now. That doesn't really translate for us. It's the idea of a flag still flying in battle. In fact, it's international anthem. Or saved is that star-spangled banner. And that wave for the land of the free and the home of the brave, indicating, you know, right there in the Revolutionary War, uh, uh, the writers uh, painting the imagery of that flag was still flying. It meant victory. That's this name. Victory. Now, friends, when we're defeated, it doesn't have to stay that way. It doesn't have to be that way. Why? Because Jehovah Nissi. You see, the victorious life is not a set of rituals. It's a person. The victorious life is not a formula. It's a person. His name is Jesus. He is the victorious life himself. And when you got saved, he moved in to live his life, not yours. When you live yours, you miss out on his and down you go. But friends, when you <laughs> say no to self and say yes to Jesus, his life is imparted to you and you experience his victorious life. Him. See, the person. Ah, maybe you're here today and there's some area in your life that's got you down. Maybe it's a bad temper. Anybody here have trouble with temper? You know, when I was a kid, I've got two brothers and two sisters, so five siblings, and growing up, dad would say, I'm number four and a lot of five, dad would say, you know, John has the worst temper. That would make me so mad. <laughs> <laughs> got to get to Jesus. Maybe you're irritable. Maybe you're not a blow-up. You're a you know, slow burn. <laughs> or maybe you're a climb-up type. Or maybe it's a vice. An addiction. Maybe it's an indulgence of the flesh and the sensuality. Maybe it's resentment and grudges and hatred. Maybe it's theft or cheating. Not being fully honest in the workplace. See, does that happen among the saints? Tragically, when they ignore Jesus, yes, it does. That's why we have these epistles telling us, hey, hey you gotta walk in the spirit so you don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. You know what that means? They were fulfilling the lust of the flesh because they weren't walking in the spirit. But friends, it's time to get to Jesus. He is the victorious life. I'm not talking about a tug of war kind of thing when you ask God to deliver you while you're still hanging on to sin. That won't work. God doesn't play tug of war, as one preacher put it. You let go of your end of the rope and then say, God, this is beyond me. If you don't step in, it's all over. That's when God steps in. I remember a young man telling me in a church in Atlanta, he said, you talked about that two years ago when we were here. He said, I got to tell you, that ton of war thing. He, he said, for me, it was chewing tobacco. Interesting, you know, different issues for different people. He said, he said, I tried. He said, I asked God to deliver me. Nothing ever happened. He said, when you told me about that ton of war thing, he re I realized that's what I was doing. I was asking God to deliver me while I was still hanging on to it. And I, he said, I got to tell you, two years ago, he said, I let go of my end of the rope. And he said, I cried out to God. And God, you got to do this because I can't. But by the way, that's faith. <laughs> He's in the name. He's in the town. 
And he smiled and said, he's been with me two years ago. He said, I haven't chewed since. Now, friends, what is it for you? The temper, the irritability, whatever, whatever, maybe the pride. We heard all sorts of things yesterday. Self-sufficiency, praying, but praying in unbelief instead of faith. Now, friends, whatever it is, it is time, is it not, for the people of God to get into the tower of the name of the Lord. Our world's going crazy. It's getting turned upside down. Things are spinning up. It is time that they see a God-filled human. It's called a spirit-filled believer. You start accessing the victorious life himself. <laughs> God on the move in a man's life, in a woman's life. And there's a reality. There's an aura. There's a, there's a Jesus look of Jesus shining through. See, holiness is not just stuff because... I'm saying moralists can do stuff. All of this is the beauty of Jesus shining through you. So the Holy One of God is animating you. That's holiness. And when he's animating you, there's love. And God is love. That's the fruit. And the eight slices are joy and peace all the way to temperance. That's when people realize God's real. He's real. And so he's the strong tower of victory. And finally, he's the strong tower of peace. This is the name Jehovah Shalom. Here's one time, Judges chapter 6, verse 24. Children of Israel, time period of the judges, things hadn't been going well. And now the Midianites had uh, come up, and they were just, you know, just, just like, just in swarms. They're encamped to attack, and this is it's not looking good at all. And the angel of the Lord, or the Old Testament appearances of God, of Jesus, appears uh, to Gideon and says, The Lord is with me. Well, Gideon doesn't realize this. The Lord is saying, Well, the Lord is with me. How come we're losing? <laughs> How come things aren't I mean, God, going so good here? And the Lord uh, commissions him, Okay, I'm with you, and so now go lead my people into victory. He still doesn't fully understand who he's talking to. But in the old uh, Testament custom of things, he says, don't leave. i got to prepare you a meal. That was just part of hospitality. He prepares the meal. He brings it out. And the angel of the Lord says, put that meal upon the rock. So here's this beautiful meal. Put on the rock. And the angel of the Lord takes a staff and touches the food. And it bursts into flames and consumes the food. Well, that was miraculous. And then the angel of the Lord departed out of the sight of Gideon, which means he vanished. That's when Gideon, Gideon realized I was in the presence of God. And he's petrified thinking God will strike him dead. You know why we think that? Because of stuff in our lives. He had it too. But God in his mercy was going to use this man. He was seeking to cultivate faith in his heart. And when he thinks that he's going to be struck dead, the angel of the Lord speaks. Now the angel of the Lord had departed, but now the voice, Shalom! Peace be unto thee. Fear not, thou shalt not die. And the Lord knew what he's thinking. And in gratitude, Gideon builds an altar. What is the altar in every one of these stories? He calls the name of that altar Jehovah Shalom. I want to ask you, friend, are you at peace this morning? We're in a troubled world, are we not? There's all sorts of trouble. In our big, broader world, wars and rumors of wars, plagues, what they call natural catastrophes, and then stuff in our own lives. Run into the name. Get to Jesus. He is peace. He doesn't just give peace. He is peace. See, he doesn't just give victory. He is the victory. In every case here, it's him. Him. He's the tower himself. Yes, he's the way to all this, but he is this. He is life. He is provision. He is victory. He is peace. Get into him. And you access all that he is. And you know, if we buy the devil's lies and just act like, well, you know, and I doubt that God will do anything for me, so you don't even run to his name. You know what happens when you don't run to the strong tower? You allow Satan to build a stronghold of doubt and unbelief in your life. Yeah, let's get out of some of that 
God shatter the strongholds. Let's submit ourselves to God, resist the devil so that he has to flee. The psalmist said in Psalm 18, verse 2, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. See, when you personalize this and you run into God, you can say, My strong tower. The psalmist says in Psalm 9, verse 10, And they that know thy name, We'll put their trust in thee. You know what that means? If we don't put our trust in God, we don't know his name. See, that's why it's, it's important from time to time to do what we're doing this morning. You do it on your own. You just look at God. Look at his word. Look at him. Why? That's when faith is nurtured. As you read and realize, okay, God has a provision for what's going on in my life right now. And they that know thy name will put their trust in thee. Those who know thy name, when issues arise, run into the name. And so whatever God has spoken to you about this morning, will you run today, right now, into the name Amen. of the Lord? Let's bow our heads for prayer. Thank you for your kind attention this morning. My friends, has God spoken? Has God spoken to you? I wonder if it's a yes. Maybe for some, I need revival. I know I'm saved, but man, things are, things are just not what they ought to be. There's not that abundant life. I need revival. In fact, I wonder who is it. Preacher, that's me. God spoke to me back from that first point. I, just like that guy, I've got to know what it is to be filled with God. And uh, I need a life again. God spoke to me. Would you raise the hand if that's you? Yes, yes. I wonder if it was a preacher for me, it was the matter of provision. Or for another, maybe it was the matter of some aspect of victory where you know you're just getting pummeled. It's time to see that turn around. Maybe it's the matter of peace. You just live anxious and troubled when that doesn't have to be. I wonder if it was a preacher. For me, it's one of these other points. Maybe it's not a point I even mentioned, but it's some other aspect in this. The answer is still true. The answer is still God. You say, God's speaking to me about an area where I need to run into the name of the Lord. And God's speaking to me. Would you raise the hand? Yes. 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 Amen. Yes. God bless you. Anyone else? say, preacher, God spoke to me as well. I need to run. Now, let me ask this. Is there anyone else say, preacher, I'm not even saying to begin with. You talked at the uh, beginning about that group called the Righteous. Are you in that group? If you die right now. Are your sins covered by the blood and is the righteousness of Christ credited to your account? That's the only way. Do you have his eternal life? It's not just getting you to heaven, it's getting Jesus into you. I wonder who's a preacher. I don't think I'm saved. If I die right now, I'd drop into hell. I need to be born again. If that's your name, would you raise the hand? Now here's what we're going to do. In a moment, I'm going to ask the pastor to pray through a verse of a song. And if God has spoken to you, would you take some time to talk to God? about what he's talking to you about. If you'd like to come and get on your knees, if you can do that without pain, you're welcome to. If you need to, just stay where you're at, whatever. But talk to God even now as the music plays.
with our heads still bowed, I want to ask the, the music to now see. So I'm going to ask you a question with our heads bowed. How many, I would like to, to pray in just a moment, and I'd really like to, to praise, I'd like to thank the Lord that uh, for what he, whatever he's done in people's hearts. And if you would say, you know, God did do something in my heart. I met with the Lord in a specific way this morning, and I'd like to be included in that prayer of praise. If that's true, would you just lift your hand up and all? Be aware of that as I pray. Yes. I see five. At least five hands. Amen. Maybe more. Now, Lord, I thank you for these that have indicated they've met with you. You spoke. You called. They responded. They got honest. And Lord, the best they knew, they ran into you. They ran into your name. And Lord, regardless of feelings, we thank you that you are me. You are life. You are provision. You are victory. You are peace. And so much more. So Lord, we thank you. We praise you for speaking to us. Such that we run into your name. And find you as all sufficient. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you may look this way. Thank you. For playing. Before I turn it over to Pastor, let me just ask. I'll close where God spoke to you today. I'm talking about like today, not like uh, I'm glad for anything previous today, but if God spoke to you today, maybe yesterday if you were here part of the uh, the morning yesterday. But uh, is there anybody that would like to just say, you know, God spoke to me about this, or just to declare what God is doing for your soul? Just did that young man in one account. Uh, he declared, you know, God spoke to me about my flesh dependence and so on. If, if uh, you feel you ought to say something, this is an opportunity for you to do that. Anyone at all? Sure. I really enjoyed the, uh, the part of war and all of you. That really meant some things for me. Um, it's just like the Lord can show me just put it into words. Like you, you can't accept deliverance from like like whatever, whatever issue it is. Right. You know, like you know, yeah. It's a huge deal because it's so easy to, to just hang on saying nothing with the ball or hang on, <laughs> which means it's not faith. <laughs> good, good. Someone else? We were, we yes. were challenged yesterday to, with some pastors to um, anything that might be a hindrance um, to revival or to the prayer. Took some points yesterday. Yes. But, uh, you know, the one that really hit home with me was the praying and unbelief. Yes. I think it hit all of the preachers. I, 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 that immediately hit me. Because I know there are times when I bring things to the Lord faithfully, but am I bringing them in vain? <laughs> uh, that's convicting. 